Super IO ITE, IT 8712F, that's the uh, Super IO chip, uh, called IT 8712F early serial.c, and it, it does exactly what the file name says. It enables the serial communication so that uh, the serial port on, oh, let's see, over here, um, is, is usable from core boot. And then the console driver uses the serial port to start um, talking and helping us figure out why nothing is working. Then comes the RAM initialization, and that's the, the, um, the fun part. That, um, that's in Northbridge AMD, AMD K8, RAM init F, so the F here is for family F, the AMD 64 CPU family. And this file is uh, some 90 kilobytes right now. So, um, so it's, it's pretty big, but it's a lot of comments as well. Once RAM initialization is set up, uh, there's some stuff that happens in between. Uh, finally, uh, or eventually, we might end up running um, this Southbridge via uh, k8t890k8m890chrome.c file, which is uh, sort of a core boot initialization driver or a core boot driver for the graphics, um, the onboard graphics part uh, in this chipset. This one. And we get some, some graphics output. The order in, in which this uh, Southbridge Chrome um, file and other files and also the RAM initialization is executed, that's controlled by this device tree uh, .cb uh, for core boot file, which describes the mainboard, uh, what components are on there, how are they connected. And later on we get to um, run through the generic hypertransport code, which sets up all the hypertransport connections in the system, the links between the CPUs and links from the CPU to any, um, uh, any other bridge, be it North Bridge or, or South Bridge. And the same goes for PCI devices, of course. All the PCI buses need to be enumerated and uh, there's some code there in devices, PCI device, to check for uh, what's, what's on the bus, what's connected to the bus and um, to set it up so that it's working. There's also a lib directory, um, which has various bits and pieces, uh, string functions, and also this USB debug direct driver for the USB uh, debug port. Maybe you don't have the super IO, but uh, oftentimes you have USB, and in USB 2.0, the EHCI spec, there's um, this debug port function where you can actually communicate over USB without DMA and only using PCI config space accesses, which is really easy and you, you don't, uh, again, you don't have to have RAM initialized to do it, so it's a good debug, debugging method. Finally, there's a, a whole bunch of kconfig files. Uh, there's one in every, every subdirectory. kconfig is the um, configuration tool from the Linux, Linux kernel. And um, we, uh, we want to use that as well. It's a nice, nice configuration method, I think, or uh, uh, configuration user interface. So this is it, uh, the, the source code, basically. The devices subdirectory, again, that's um, used for the device tree that Core Boot builds at runtime. It checks all the stuff that's connected in the system and builds this, this long list of devices and um, then there's some generic code to deal with each class of hardware. So this is, this is source and uh, that's good. The kconfig files are, are used with the kconfig system, but kconfig was introduced fairly recently in, in the current code base. And before that, we, we used the targets subdirectory quite a lot, and for some main boards, it's still necessary to use that. There you, um, uh, you create this, um, um, first of all, a subdirectory for the vendor, in this case, emulation, because it's an emulated vendor, I guess. And then you create um, uh, the board name subdirectory, in this case, QEMU. 
And finally, you put a config.lb file there, uh, which you fill with some settings for how this board is going to, or for um, how Coreboot is going to be built for this board. Number of PCI slots and, and stuff like that. So again, this was used only for, for the, um, the previous configuration method, but it's still necessary in some cases because kconfig isn't quite, um, quite there for all the boards yet. And two more directories, documentation, it's what it says, and utilities for utilities. So we have some utilities that are really, really central for core boot, for example, CBFS tool, which I'm going to mention uh, a bit more about in a bit. And there's a whole bunch of other utilities there as well. So I mentioned configuration and build this config LB file. The old way to to build something or to build the core boot for a board is to go into this uh, targets directory vendor board and uh, make some changes in this config LB file uh, so that it matches uh, your needs. Maybe you want to change the resulting uh, the, the file size for the the resulting core boot.rom file if you have a flash chip with just a uh, different size than the default for this board. Then you have to go up a few directories and you have to run this build target command and then it generates a whole build directory with make files and, and everything which is named um, uh, by a parameter inside this config lb file. So then you have to go down to that subdirectory and run make and then you get a coreboot.rom file. Oh, that's right, you specify the payload inside uh, config.lb as well. Um, which, which payload file you want to use with this core boot. And there can be only one with, uh, with the old build system. And that's, that, yeah, hmm. it's, it's, it worked, but it, it's not so fun to deal with, I think. Uh, it, it still works, but um, the new way I like a lot better, make menu config and just change the settings and run make, and then you get this core boot.rom file. Um, it's, it's a lot nicer. So the code flow at runtime, I talked a bit about it um, in the source tree, uh, or connected to the source tree. First thing that happens is enter protected mode, enable caches RAM, console output again, and um, go over the hypertransport or uh, the most central components of the system, initialize them, set up the speeds. For hypertransport, for example, you have to also do a reset here, uh, you set the, the frequency you want hypertransport to run at, and then you reset. And when you reset, it comes up with a higher frequency, and then you do the first things again and check, oh, okay, now it's running quickly. Then I skip that step and I don't reset again. Um, Coreboot supports a fallback or, or normal scheme where you can actually have two sets of your firmware inside the same flash chip. And after the, the early initialization, that's um, uh, decided upon which path to, to follow. So you can have a, a really safe updating method by only replacing the, the normal image. And if it doesn't start properly, then uh, next time you reboot, Coreboot will start the fallback. Next step, initialize RAM. Do all the, the, uh, the, the hard work, talking with the green, the green bus going all the way around and fetching the parameters and uh, from, from the memory modules and setting up the memory controller so that it's possible to uncompress and run the core boot RAM part of core boot, which doesn't seem to do much, but it, what it does is, is kind of complex. Uh, it allocates all the resources, divides up the address space in the CPU and um, uh, shares it, or so that it's, it's, um, it's shared between all the devices in the system, so the PCI and the PCI Express, and um, all the rest uh, of the stuff that needs to be configured, IO, uh, IO ports and interrupts and DMA, and, and uh, that, that code is, is generic, and you don't really have to change it per, per board, so that's, that's nice, but sometimes, the main board requires some uh, sp specific configuration as well. Maybe there's this odd uh, function on this main board, uh, only on this main board, and you have to do some manual setup uh, or resource allocation for that. After that, next step, Coreboot creates some tables 
which it leaves behind in RAM for whoever.